All right. Welcome, everyone. Hello. Welcome to today's program, What Do Molecules in Mud Tell Us About the Environment of Our Early Hominin Ancestors? This is part of our ongoing Hot Topic Human Origins Today topic series. My name is Brianna Pobiner, and I'm a paleoanthropologist and educator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History. Whether this is your first time joining us or you've attended before, we're so glad to have you here. Before we get started, here's a few housekeeping notes. This discussion offers closed captioning. You can turn the captions on or off via the CC button, which should be located at the bottom of the Zoom interface. As you have questions, please go ahead and submit them to our Q&A box, which is at the top or bottom of your screen, so we can sort through as many as possible. The Q&A really flies by. The Q&A box is also where, we're share, where, excuse me, where we'll share any relevant links during the program, so keep an eye out there. Um, and also, um, during the presentation by our speaker, Dr. Kevin Uno, both myself and Dr. Grace Veach will be behind the scenes answering some of your questions in the Q&A. So we'll start with an opening presentation by our speaker, Dr. Kevin Uno, and then I'll join him here to take your questions from the Q&A. So now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our speaker. Dr. Kevin Uno is an Associate Research Professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Observatory of Columbia University. He's a paleoecologist whose primary research focus is on exploring the role of climate and environmental change on mammalian and human evolution. To do this, he uses stable isotope and organic geochemical methods to reconstruct climate, vegetation, and mammalian diets from the neogene, which is the past 24 million years to the present. He has led or co-authored a series of papers that link dietary changes in mammals and hominins to late neogene vegetation change. Since 2013, he's focused on development and application of molecular biomarker analyses on terrestrial and marine sediments to reconstruct ecosystem structure, hydroclimate, and fire in ancient environments. And now I'd like to welcome Kevin to the screen and we're looking forward to seeing his presentation. Thanks, Brianna. I'm gonna share my screen here. Hopefully you can all see that. Okay, uh, thank you all for joining me today um, for this talk on molecules and mud. And we'll start with the, the title slide and the photo here taken by Jason Hagani, a former undergraduate student who took a course with me and worked in my lab and is essentially taken off on a career in professional photography. And this shows a sort of iconic grassland in East Africa today uh, with some of our favorite fauna, zebras grazing. And um, the main goal of my lab, my research group, is to reconstruct these types of environments in the past to better understand the landscapes, environments that our ancestors evolved in. And that allows us to better understand and explore how evolution may have been influenced by climate and vegetation change. Let's see. Turn on my laser pointer here. Okay, so just an introductory slide of who I am. Um, I am an earth scientist, a paleoecologist, uh, and I study climate evolution and a little bit of wildlife forensics. And the common thread in all of these um, sort of aspects of my research are using geochemistry to explore the past, or in some cases, the present um, of natural ecosystems. Um, and today I'll talk mostly about biomarkers or molecules that are preserved in sediments. We find them in terrestrial sediments. These are fossil soils uh, in Southern Kansas. Okay, that give us a record of the Great Plains over millions of years. Um, we can also extract sediments from cores uh, from, from the, the marine system, from the oceans, and those tell us something about the Earth's past as well. Um, and we also, to kind of understand what these data tell us, we work on modern plants. So we study modern plants in Eastern Africa as well. And then some of my earlier work uh, has it involved um, understanding the diets using the chemistry of teeth. Okay, so as I mentioned, the main theme of my research is understanding the links between climate, vegetation, and 
fun at. And if you think about wherever you live, wherever you are today, right now, okay, there's some amount of rainfall that you get where you are. Right? Maybe you think it's too much or too little, but it just is what it is. Um, that rainfall effectively determines how much um, and what kinds of plants grow where you live, okay? And that in turn, that vegetation that grows controls what kind of animals that can live there. So if you think about the drier deserts, say the Western US, okay? We don't have a lot of large mammals there because there's just not a lot of food around to support them. Whereas if you look in, you know, say the savannas or the grasslands of East Africa, where there's abundant vegetation, it can support large mammals or mega herbivores like elephants or even rhinos. I think, is my screen off my camera? Hang on a sec, folks. I'm still going. Okay, so if we take this research theme and actually put some questions to the diagram, um, the main question that drives my research is how did climate influence major shifts in terrestrial ecosystems? And what were the evolutionary consequences? And we can break that down into um, additional sort of sub questions shown here on the left. What caused the emergence of the world's tropical grasslands beginning 10 million years ago? And did climate and vegetation play a significant role in the evolution of humans? Now, as an earth scientist, we, I'm presenting this diagram of this sort of link between climate, vegetation, and fauna. And for a look under the hood, sort of how we look at it in a more technical way, um, I can show. And show you this diagram. And what this shows is how we look at it in my lab group. And we've broadly defined it into sort of a climate aspect and then the effects on the ecosystem. So in the climate column on the left, you see we have moisture, essentially how much rain is the system getting. Um, CO2 is important because that's how plants grow. They take CO2 in and, and grow, make tissues, plant tissues. And then temperature. So the warmer it is, the more water a plant needs to survive. And so all these things are essentially climate variables. And then the sort of ecosystem variables include what kind of vegetation. So um, in this talk today, I'll talk about C3 and C4 plants. The simple way to think about it is that the C3 plants um, on Earth today are mostly trees and shrubs, woody vegetation. And uh, in the tropics, and particularly in East Africa today, all the grasses are C4 plants. And this C3 and C4 terminology just describes the photosynthetic pathway that these plants use. So the climate, okay, the amount of rainfall, the CO2 level and the temperature really affect the balance of plants on the landscape, but it's not just those climate variables. We also have things on the landscape like herbivores, which eat the plants, okay? And things like fire, which burn the plants. And so, all of these things are interacting at a fairly complex level. Um, and those are the things that we are using geochemistry to try to understand both in the present and modern ecosystems so that we can explore past ecosystems. Okay, uh, as I mentioned, um, about 10 million years ago, there was a major change on planet Earth. And that is the evolution of grassy ecosystems the grasslands that we know of today, planet Earth, um, all began right around 10 million years, 10 to five, let's say, uh, in a period called the Miocene, okay? And so in this diagram, all these boxes show regions in the world where the expansion of grassy ecosystems has been documented. And the numbers here, like 10, eight to six, eight to six, that's in millions of years. So starting at 10 million years in Africa, that's the first place we see these grasslands expanding. And then stretching to about eight to six across uh, the Northern subtropics, the Great Plains of North America, where we grow all of our corn today, okay, were originally C4 grasslands. Corn itself is in fact a C4 grassland. 
Um, and then down here are just lists of publications and things. And the way in which we reconstruct the expansion of these grass ecosystems isn't the grasses themselves. Grasses don't fossilize. We can't see them in the past. And so we have to use geochemistry. And in this case, we use geochemistry of soil carbonate, which are minerals in the soil that are recording what plants are growing above them. We use tooth enamel because herbivores eat the plants and they record what the animal ate. Um, plant wax biomarkers, which I'll talk about today. These are essentially molecular fossils that record what plants were there. And then sort of bulk organic matter in the system. Kevin, before you move on to the next slide, your video had frozen and now it seems to be off. I wonder if you wanna try to maybe like turn sure. off or on your camera again and we'll see if we can get that fixed. Yeah, yeah, I noticed it stopped. Let me try to get it going again. Yes, I can. We can also, though, just keep going with it like it is, and then maybe we'll try again when it comes to the Q&A part. Yeah, it's not quite working. I apologize for that. Uh, That's but okay. More, more focusing on the slides, I guess. Okay. <laughs> okay. So here we are at the point where we have this major change in the Earth system. Um, you know, the Earth is 4.56 billion years old, and yet grasses are a relatively new feature. They evolved probably in the last 80 million years. But then these C4 grasses, these special grasses, really exploded across the globe about 10 million years ago. So why is that? And uh, I guess, why should we care about grasses? So hopefully I can convince you in the next few slides why grasses are important. Um, we are a world approaching 8 billion people rapidly. And if you think about it, um, the diet of the world, those 8 billion people, um, is essentially grass. We are a grassy species. So listed here are uh, three major grasses that we rely on, wheat, corn, and rice. And this number is the amount in millions of tons that we grow per year, okay? So we grow a lot of these different grasses. And while these may not look like your daily diet, um, this might look a bit more like some of our daily diets. Uh, one of my favorite ways to consume grasses is uh, through this product here. Okay, there's barley in beer. Uh, I have a 10 year old son and his one of his favorite ways of consuming grasses is through this sort of monstrosity of cereal. It's a lucky charms. And the, the cereal bits here are made of oat and even these uh, marshmallows um, are made of grass. They're, they're made of high fructose corn syrup. And the corn is a C4 grass. So it's an entire bowl of grass, essentially. In the US, Coke is flavored with high fructose corn syrup. Again, um, C4 grass, corn, so it's a bottle of grass. Uh, most of our beef is fed on feed corn in the United States. So the patty here is, is predominantly grass derived. Um, and then the bun, of course, comes from wheat. And then uh, rice, as in my house as a child, was a major staple. And in South Asia, Asia, many parts of the world is the main uh, food for many people. So today we rely heavily on grasses in our diets. And it's been that way for a long time in the past, um, going back 3.7 million years, using the chemistry of teeth, we found that humans and our ancestors relied on C4 grasses in our diets. And they're even celebrated as in here in this um, picture of the grain harvest in ancient Egypt. So we have deep, strong roots to grassy ecosystems, particularly in our diet. So as I mentioned, my job is to reconstruct life in the Miocene, or at least during this period of grassy expansion. And so here I've got a cartoon of what the savanna might have looked like, um, let's say, eight million years ago in Africa when elephants had four tusks, 
and these horses had three toes and stripes like zebras and everything looked different and we don't have a time machine i wish we did but in, instead of that the best thing we have i would argue um, are fossils and geochemistry and so what i do as an earth scientist is try to reconstruct this landscape repaint this picture using what we have in the sedimentary record okay and on this landscape all of the C3 plant, all of the trees, sorry, are C3 plants, the woody vegetation. And that just describes the photosynthetic pathway. It's called the C3 pathway that they use. And all the grasses are C4 plants. So they use the C4 photosynthetic pathway. And within these different proxies or things we can measure in sediments are things like fossil teeth, uh, soil carbonates made of carbon and oxygen, and these leaf waxes, which are just hydrocarbon chains made of carbon and hydrogen. So when I go to the field and dig around in the dirt, uh, this is what we're left with. Okay, so here's some pictures, some fossilized root casts, which are made of, of carbon and oxygen, okay, and they're soil carbonates. Uh, biomarkers we can get out of basically any sediment, okay. These are Miocene sediments in, in the Middle East. And then here's a, a fossil horse tooth that we picked up off the ground, and that has carbon and oxygen in it. So we have these key elements, and you may know that we are made of carbon and oxygen. And so those are going to tell us something about the landscape and the diets. Um, I know this is a lunchtime talk, and it's not really fair or nice to put up the table of periodic table of elements while we're eating, but I cut off the bottom half at least, which has all the really hard to pronounce elements. And we're actually just going to focus on the top um, and with the elements highlighted in blue um, and especially those circled in red. Okay, Hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, these are the elements that we're made of, right? And so if we can study these elements, we can, in the past, we can possibly learn something about um, our diets or the landscapes and those sorts of things. Um, and the way we do that is we use the isotopes of these elements. So I'm going to talk about mostly carbon today. So below, I have two flavors of carbon, or two stable isotopes of carbon. On the left is carbon-12. We call carbon-12 because it has six protons and six neutrons. Carbon-13 uh, just has an extra neutron, so it has six protons and seven neutrons. Okay, So they're both stable. They're not radioactive. And the only difference is in their mass. Carbon-13 is a little bit heavier, okay? So, and in this periodic table, we see a two-dimensional sheet, right? It's just a table, but isotope geochemists like myself see it as a three-dimensional table. And so the carbon is actually a column, right? This isn't a scale, but in the real world, in the natural world, about 99% of all carbon is carbon-12, and about 1% is carbon-13. There's a little bit of carbon-14 out there. It's useful for dating and things, uh, but it's so, so, so rare compared to these two that we're gonna ignore it for today. Um, and it's the same for oxygen. Oxygen-16 is the common isotope. It's, again, 99%. Hydrogen has a common isotope, 99%. So the point is there's a light isotope, carbon-12, and it's heavy, stable isotope, carbon okay? Um, now I'm adding math to your lunch time. I apologize, but it's, it's fairly simple and you don't have to hang on. This isn't critical to the talk. But the way we get at measuring this is we don't actually count like the number of 12 atoms and 13 atoms in carbon. We look at the ratio of the abundance of the 13 carbons to 12 carbons in our sample. So today it's going to be mud from the ocean, mostly. Um, and we compare that ratio uh, with the ratio of some standard that every other lab out there is measuring, okay? And so, and then we multiply by a thousand, okay? it gets us out of the decimal world. And because we multiply by a thousand, we use this term per mil. It looks a lot like the percent symbol, except there's this extra dot, because instead of percent, the one of a hundred is one of a thousand, so per mil, okay? And that's called the delta notation. So all the numbers you see will be delta 13C, and that's just telling us the ratio of 13C to 12C with respect to some standard. So what does that look like in the real world when we're working with plants? And how does carbon work as a vegetation proxy? So 
As I mentioned, there's two flavors of plants out there, C3 plants, which are woody plants, and C4 plants, which in Eastern Africa, where I work, are basically all the grasses. And if we measure the carbon isotope ratio of, say, these uh, acacia trees in the back, we would get a carbon isotope ratio of somewhere in here, or any C3 or woody plant in East Africa. And if we measured the isotope ratio of a C4 grass, we would get an isotope ratio somewhere in here, say minus 15 to minus 10 per mil. So we can easily differentiate based on the isotopes of a plant, uh, whether it's a C3 plant, a woody plant, or a C4 plant, a grass. Okay, and that's helpful. We can also take these plant waxes and measure their isotopes. So all plants, if you think of maybe a succulent you have in your house, they have waxes on them. And you see it really well on these, these succulents, you know, like the jade plant, okay? Those waxes are there to protect the plant and also to help it retain water. Um, and they're made of these hydrocarbons. So here's a stick diagram of just carbons and, and hydrogens shown here. And we call these N-alkanes or normal alkanes, normal because they're straight chained, okay? They're saturated linear hydrocarbons. And plants produce these N-alkanes of various chain lengths. And by chain length, I mean the number of carbons in that. This is called a homolog. So plants produce um, N-alkane homologs or chain lengths with 29 to 35 carbons in length. Okay? And these are preserved in terrestrial and marine sediments. How do they get to marine sediments? Well, just like pollen and dust are blown offshore into the ocean, these plant waxes are also abraded from the plant and blown offshore. The nice thing is nothing in the ocean makes N-alkanes that are of the C29 to C35 chain length. So they're deposited in the ocean and the ocean is a, a wonderful archive. It's quiet, it's cold, and it's deep. So as sediments accumulate in the ocean, layer by layer by layer, we have a record, essentially a tape recorder, um, recording the, the vegetation on the nearby continents. We can measure the isotopes of these waxes themselves, the individual waxes, and they have carbon isotope ratios that differ depending on if you're a C3 plant or a C4 plant. So here's, here's a diagram that shows how we do this in the lab starting with um, going in the ocean and drilling a core up the seafloor. And the further down you drill, the farther back in time you go. And so here's a piece of the core that arrived in my lab. Um, it's about 10 million years old. And we crush it up and we use organic solvents to extract all of the biomarkers. And so this is kind of a cocktail of various leaf waxes, all kinds of biomarkers. And then we separate them using what's called silica gel chromatography. And that basically just separates them out by the, the molecular structure. So all the alkanes go into one of these little vials and different polar compounds go into other vials. But we just take the alkane fraction, the one we're looking for. And um, then we measure the alkane concentration um, and, and um, which alkanes they are, in fact, the identification on this instrument here, which is called a gas chromatograph mass spectrometer or a GCMS. Okay, so that's how we go from mud to molecules in one slide. And this is what the data actually look like. Um, here's relative abundance, so how much of something there is. And then this is um, over the course of the run, different molecules come out at different times based on their mass, basically. So <clears throat> in this particular sample, the short chain stuff the short chain homologs, C10 to say C25 or something, those are mostly um, produced by marine organisms, microbes and such. And then over here, we have the terrestrial plant marks. It's the longer chain stuff, ranging from 27 to 35 uh, carbons in length. We can then measure the isotope ratios of them and use that to figure out the proportion of C3 to C4 plants in the landscape. 10 million years ago, for example, or the age of this particular sample. So we did that many, many, many times in the lab. Uh, and this is a whole list of samples that we've analyzed from cores off the eastern coast of Africa and off the western coast of Africa to really try to understand vegetation change across the continent, but especially in the rift where a lot of hominin fossils 
are found. Okay, so this is age on the y-axis going from 17 million years to present. This is the carbon isotope ratio, but it's easier, I think, to look at this axis where data on the left side indicate more trees on the landscape and data on the right side of the plot indicate more grasses. And the key feature here is that as we move through time, we had mostly woody landscapes. And then around 10 million years ago, boom, we start to see an increase in the amount of grasses through time. The next panel over is the hydrogen isotope from these N alkanes. And I won't go into it too deeply other than to say that these tell us whether it was wet or dry or arid on the landscape. And we don't really see any major trends through time, suggesting that um, there was not a shift towards more arid climates or wetter climates that correlates to this broad increase we see in grasses on the landscape. The final thing I'll say about this is that um, the oldest hominin, our first ancestor, is purported to be this one, Sahelanthropus chadensis, at 7 million years ago. So our entire history, working all the way up to Homo sapiens, evolved in the presence of grassy ecosystems. And this is work I did with um, two of my former postdoctoral advisors, Pradega Pulsar at USC, or sorry, UCSC, and uh, Peter Domenico. Okay. So now I'm just going to focus over near where all the hominin fossils are in Eastern Africa. And here are two sites where marine cores are from that we'll primarily focus on. And here again, I'm just plotting the carbon isotope ratio over the last 25 million years ago. And over this 10 million year period, essentially nothing but C3 environments or woody environments. And then at 10 million years, boom, we see C4 grasses expanding. Now, there's one problem here, which is with carbon isotopes, we can see C4 grasses and C3 woody vegetation. But before C4 grasses, there was another kind of grass. There were C3 grasses. But we can't use isotopes to see them because isotopically, they look like C3 trees. And so here's a picture of two modern ecosystems today on Mount Kenya, this forest and this grassland. And they're both made of C3 plants which means they look identical to each other isotopically. So we've run into a slight problem as we go back in time down here. We basically can't use isotopes to understand the ecosystems. Well, why do we care about this period here? Well, in Eastern Africa, we see the first appearance of a lot of the modern mammal lineages that we see today on the landscape. This is when uh, pigs arrived, when the first rhinos arrived. Some of the first uh, elephants arose, were their ancestors, and we see the first hippos. So a lot of evolutionary events happened back here. And if we look at the human evolution side of things, during this time, we see the monkey ape split, the first proconsulate, which is an early hominoid, or hominid, and then the first hominoid. Okay, so a lot of action and events where we want to characterize the landscape and the ecosystem, but we can't. So what my group has been doing um, is trying to use all these different types of molecules. Um, this is sort of a menu here to study past ecosystems. Uh, so we look at, instead of the isotopes, we look at the ab abundances or the amounts of these different chain links or homologs. We've uh, been working on some biomarkers that tell us what grasses are, or grassy abundance. And then we've been trying to reconstruct fires in the past using uh, a different kind of biomarker called PAHs. And I'm just going to talk briefly about this one here and how we could use the relative abundance of these to reconstruct past environments because we have to leave our isotopes behind going beyond 10 million years. So fraction woody cover is uh, a term that's used to describe how much shade there is. So if you're standing in the forest and there's no sunlight on the forest floor, that's a fraction woody cover of one or 100%. And if you're getting a sunburn on the beach, that's a fraction woody cover of, of zero. And why is this important to early humans? Well, they didn't have air conditioning or homes to go into, so they would rely on shade to thermoregulate. And East Africa, just as it is today, was very hot in the Miocene. So shade was an incredibly important resource. And so we try to reconstruct the amount of shade on the landscape to understand how that's changed through time and may have influenced 
the evolution of early humans. So here's an example of how we characterize it. We get a fish eye lens on the camera, we point it up at the sky, and we take a photo. And here's a bamboo forest with the fraction woody cover, probably around 60 or 70 percent. So we've done that at lots of parks around Africa. Um, and our, what we're attempting to do here, instead of using isotopes, is to reconstruct fraction woody cover using the different abundances of these long chain alkanes. So here's an example. We went to a dense forest here where there's about 95% woody cover, 0.95. You can't really see the sun. Here's us in the forest. And then we went to a nearby open grassland and we grabbed some soil because there are alkanes loaded in the soils from plants that live there. And these are the uh, distributions of the alkanes, these biomarkers. In the forest site in green, you can see there's a lot of the short chain stuff, shorter chain, let's say, and then it decreases. Whereas in the grassy ecosystem, with almost no shade or woody cover, we see a lot more longer chains like C33 and C35. So we did this at a variety of sites, uh, you know, 15 grasslands or something, some wooded grasslands and 10 forest sites. And these are the sort of distributions of these different homologs, the different abundances. And the main point is that we see longer chain lengths in the grassy ecosystems and shorter chain lengths in the forested ecosystems. And we can go beyond these sort of relative bar plots and actually compare the fraction we cover to this ratio that we developed, which is taking the long chain and dividing it by the shorter chain. And there's a nice correlation here between this ratio, the amount of long stuff compared to the short stuff, and the fraction woody cover. What that means is we can use this relationship to reconstruct the fraction woody cover going back in time based on this modern relationship. So we did that. Um, we went back to these cores where we have the carbon isotope data. And here's the part between 10 and 25 million years the carbon isotopes don't really help us. They're silent on the relative abundance of grasses to woody vegetation. But using our new fraction woody cover relationship from the modern soils, we can apply that and reconstruct fraction woody cover through time. And the main difference in these two plots, going back 25 million years, is this increase in uh, grasses on the landscape, or in turn a decrease in fraction woody cover around 14 million years. So this suggests that perhaps there was a burst of C4 grass, or excuse me, C3 grasses around 14 million years um, that we don't detect with the isotopes. So this is a new way to see past landscapes. So in summary, um, C4 grasslands began to spread across Africa something like 10 million years ago. Um, a key point is that we are a grassy species. Our lineage evolved, the hominins, as grasslands expanded across the continent of Africa seven million years ago. Um, our grassy diets today stretch back millions of years. We know that from the chemistry in our teeth. And geochemistry can provide windows into earth history, like the expansion of grassy ecosystems, um, as well as into human evolution. So, um, I want to just talk for a few minutes um, or a minute or two about earth sciences and paleoanthropology and diversity, equity, inclusion, and anti-racism at my institution Lamont and in the broader community. Um, one of my former colleagues has written a lot on this um, and her name is Kohaley Dutt. And she recently wrote, geosciences are among the least diverse science, technology, engineering, and mathematics fields in the United States with almost 90% of doctoral degrees award to white people. And so we have some major changes to make. And in my group, um, our approach is to listen, learn, and discuss. Um, as scientists, we're mostly good at talking and talking about our research, but now we're trying to listen. And we're trying to understand how to increase diversity at my institution through hiring um, at different levels. Um, in, in my position in doing research in East Africa, we have the opportunity to educate and train African and BIPOC students. Uh, and then I am also working on increasing scientific capacity in Africa through um, a lab that we've built up there. 
So one of the things we do is train African students um, at the Turkana University College. It's a new master's program in human evolutionary biology. So I've spent the last year um, teaching students how to sample fossil teeth for isotope work, how to extract water from plants to measure isotopes in plants. Um, we collect rainfall to measure the isotopes in water. This all helps us understand how, how past climate change by understanding isotopes in, in modern climate. Um, and then uh, we've built up what's called the Permil Lab, Paleo and Eco Hydrology Research, the Impala, Research, Impala Isotope Lab. Um, and through that, we're also training uh, US based undergrads as well as African students in a variety of isotope related measurements. Uh, and so that's an ongoing effort um, in my group. So thank you for hanging out today. I apologize for the camera snafu. I think it's actually because my computer is running out of memory. Uh, but I'd like to acknowledge all these colleagues, field assistants, uh, lab folks who've helped out, funding agencies, et cetera. And uh, thank you for your time. I'm happy to take questions. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Kevin. Um, let's see, we will, I guess we can keep trying to get your camera going, but if it doesn't work, then we'll just, we'll do it like this. Yeah. Um, and we have a lot, that was a wonderful presentation. We have a lot of questions already. So I'm just going to jump right in. Um, and actually here, let's start with a modern question. So here's a question from Sophie who asks, do modern humans make use of any C3 grasses for food? Yes, the resounding answer is yes. Uh, both wheat and rice are, are um, C3 grasses, so yeah. Okay, great. Great question. Um, and do you wanna try, by the way, to turn your camera off and on again, maybe? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm since trying. This, okay, <laughs> since this- I think the only stuff. way is for me to leave and come back and I might as well just stay, so. Okay, yeah. all right. All right. Sorry. No, that's okay. Um, all right, so we actually have the same question from two people. Let's see, I know these why questions about the past are tough, but both Lisa and Charles ask, Lisa asked, do we know why grasslands emerged 10 million years ago? And Charles asked, so why did the grasses expand? Mm, that, that's the question that kind of keeps me up at night or that like pops in my head in, in the shower, you know, the thing that's always biting at you. And we broadly know what controls um, how and why C4 plants can outcompete. It's all competition out there. Uh, on the landscape, the C3 plants. And it has to do with really the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere and the amount of available water. And so uh, CO2, reconstructing CO2 in the past in the atmosphere is like one of the holy grail measurements in earth science. You know, we can do it in ice cores because they're in the bubbles going back about a million years. But beyond that, it's really tricky. And so we think, and we argued in, in several of our publications, that CO2 decline um, around 10 million years ago probably triggered the expansion of C4 grasses in Africa. We also wrote a paper on the expansion of C4 grasses in South Asia. And there we think it's actually a change in the rainfall patterns. So we can do a couple of things. We can change the dial on CO2 in the atmosphere, or we can change the dial on the amount of rainfall or the timing of the rainfall. So if you have a long dry season in a particular ecosystem that really makes it difficult for trees to take hold to for tree recruitment and so dry season length um, really gives a, a bonus to grassy ecosystems so there's a, there's many different things including fire which i didn't talk about so essentially the answer to the question is it's, it's several other talks and we don't quite have the answer that's a very fair answer. Um, I want to get back to um, a little bit, since you mentioned cores, this is a question I think about um, drill cores. And this is a question from Adam who asks, with this plant material being deposited in the oceans, how confident are you of the provenance of that material? For example, distance from its terrestrial location, or does that not matter? It does. The use of the word provenance suggests this question asker has a scientific background <laughs> and it's a really excellent question. Um, you know, we can use modern wind field diagrams to say, you know, these are where these today 
dust and plant waxes and pollen and things are being deposited from this sort of source area. And we worry about that a lot. And we think about it a lot when we choose the marine cores that we um, extract and analyze biomarkers from. So um, the, the, the sites we chose are the best we can do. And we are pretty confident in their sources being East Africa on the east side and then West Africa, we're collecting stuff from the Sahel and the Sahara. Great, thank you. And this question goes back a little bit to um, sort of ties into your answer to not this past question, but the one before. So Sophie asks, is fraction woody cover something that actually changes across wet and dry seasons in your study location? That's, that's an excellent question. Um, it's more of a long-term change, like you have, you know, tree die off or a fire comes through and completely changes the ecosystem and it comes back, let's say in a different way, but it's really, we're really looking at probably like decadal to century changes uh, um, associated with longer term climate trends. But um, you could imagine, uh, at least where I live in, in New York City, all the local parks have um, deciduous trees. So the fraction we cover actually changes every season when the leaves drop. Um, and then it's, it's changing right now um, because it's bud burst and leaves are coming out. And so there are some seasonal changes that are sort of smaller, but long-term, it's, it's longer-term climate cycles. Yeah. Great question. Okay, great. Here's a question about um, some of our closest relatives. So Reha asks, as much as I know about chimpanzees and bonobos, they eat mostly fruit. Which hominins did eat C4 grass 3 million years ago? Oh, that's a great question. Um, well, we use carbon isotopes in teeth to determine the proportion of C3 to C4 foods in the diet. And so we can't actually differentiate fruits from nuts, from leaves, which are all food sources from C3 plants. We wish we could, but fortunately we have other colleagues who could do that looking at the wear or the scratches on the teeth. And so, um, but based on our work with isotopes, the C4 eating uh, hominins were some of the earlier Australopithecines. Um, there's one called Kenyanthropus, which looks very similar to Australopithecus that was in Kenya about three and a half million years ago. And then um, there's some Australopithecus um, from the Awash in Ethiopia that have a higher C4 content. And then the the C4 superstar for the hominins is something called Paranthropus, which had huge teeth and giant chewing muscles and was really um, dedicated to, you know, having about 75% of C4 um, foods in its diet. Um, I have, excuse me, two questions that are <coughs> about differences between C3 and C4 grasses. So, um, or plants in general. So the first one is from Niels who asks, why are C4 plants a better source of nutrition than C3 plants? Mm. Well, I wouldn't say that they're actually a better source of nutrition or not. I think, um, you know, how, how do we measure nutrition? You, you can look at things like um, crude protein content um, or, you know, the digestible fraction of cellulose, let's say. I mean, in today, our modern diets, we're not eating a lot of C4 plants directly. I mean, I'm sure you have corn on the cob in the summer, but we're mostly eating um, proteins from meats that are fed those, um, those C4 plants. And so, in fact, if you go out and measure uh, things like these macronutrients, protein and carbohydrates, they're often higher in a lot of C3 plants, except for when C4 grasses are young, when they're just sprouting, they're really uh, nutritionally dense. So that changes from season to season, really. So actually, before I ask the other C3, C4 question, I wanna jump in because someone had a question related to sort of um, uh, grasses as food. So Walter asked, how much protein do grasses provide? What about essential amino acids? Okay, Walter, you're stretching my knowledge here a bit, but um, from the, the data that I've seen, you know, uh, the crude protein content in grasses can be somewhere from one to 3%. Um, and what was the second part of the question? Sorry. Uh, essential amino acids. Essential amino So um, I don't know which 
essential amino acids or ingresses, but there are some for sure. There's some in most foods that, that we eat. Um, but because it's so low in the, in the foliage, like the grass leaves or the stems, um, we often think of um, more calorically dense plant foods as food sources for, as someone mentioned, uh, chimps and bonobos today are going for fruits and things. Um, or nuts, which have really high fat and protein content. So, you know, animals choose things that are calorically dense because it's less expensive to digest them and you get more return from them. Excellent. Um, I'm going to go back to that question about C3 and C4 grasses. So Steve asks, doesn't the distribution of C3 and C4 grasses change with temperature? For example, taxonomic richness of C3 grasses gradually increases with decreasing temperature with higher elevation and latitude. Yeah, there is a sort of wonderful interplay between uh, temperature and CO2 that can essentially define what plant type C3 or C4 uh, will grow in that region. Um, and, and that temperature is, is eventually somehow tied to water use and water use efficiency. Um, and so uh, the way we measure it is this um, quantum yield. So how much carbon can a C3 plant fix given some amount of light that hits it? It's called photon flux density. But just think of it as the amount of light hitting a leaf. And if you take the same environment temperature and CO2, how much can a C4 plant fix and whoever can fix more under those conditions is going to be out competing the other plant group in that particular ecosystem. And so we find that at low CO2 and high temperature, C4 takes the cake easily every time. What's interesting is today on planet Earth, CO2 is rising significantly. Uh, it's, it's risen probably 70 ppm in my lifetime. And so that's pushing the advantage more towards um, C3 plants. And we don't know the consequences of that and how that's gonna play out for, you know, say C4 crops that we grow um, and even C3 crops. But we are, we are running a major experiment on earth today that didn't seem to be intended. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, so actually, here's a related question, I think, to that from Marta, who says, thank you for the talk, Kevin. My question is about the C3 grass expansion at about 14 million years ago. Why were these C3 grasses eventually replaced by C4 ones? Mm, that's, that's a good question, too. It relates to, it's a great follow-on because, so I imagine C3 grasses replacing um, C3 woody vegetation probably due to rainfall or seasonality. So if the dry season length becomes longer, again, it's harder for trees to get established and you can have higher tree mortality with longer dry seasons. That leads to, once you have dead fuel on the ground, you know, more fires and things, and that promotes um, grassland replacement of these woody ecosystems. So that's probably how we got to the increase in these C3 grasslands. And then, um, all things being equal, um, if you put a C3 and a C4 grass on the landscape, based on what I just discussed with the ability to fix carbon better than the other, um, C4 plants were probably better equipped um, in terms of the biochemistry of that photosynthetic process, um, starting around 10 million years ago, perhaps due to a CO2 drop or, again, changes in, in rainfall, because C, C4 plants will do better, outcompete um, C3 plants in, in drier conditions. They're arid adapted. They use less water because they're more efficient. Here's a question that might um, help those of us who are interested in diets of early humans. So Jack asks, is there a chemical distinction between cooked versus uncooked C4 grasses? Mm, that is a great question. I, I wish there were, but the answer is no. And, um, you know, the, the, processing of, of plant foods or meats, you know, protein rich stuff. Um, we, we can't see that with isotopes um, and we, we can't even see trophic level. Like we can't tell if say our, our hominin, uh, not ants, direct answers, but a parenthesis, which loves C4. We can't actually tell from the isotopes whether it's eating meat, like from uh, some kind of antelope that was a C4 eater 
or if it was eating, say, roots of a C4 plant or C4 grass itself. And so we have some major limitations with isotopes, but they've gotten us pretty far. And so there are some more nuanced questions, like what Jack is asking, uh, that we need to keep developing new tools to address. So here is a follow on question sort of related that um, also mentions isotopes. And this is a question from Gabrielle. Um, Kevin, your graph suggests that the last 500,000 years, the environment became more wooded, whereas the isotopes do not support this. Can you explain? Can you please explain? That is, is tough to explain. And it's, it's a trend in the data that we are trying to understand more fully. Um, these, you know, fraction woody cover doesn't always directly correlate exactly with the amount of C4 grass. And so we have to sort this out. There's other discrepancies in the graph. The broad trends are that, you know, when C4 grasses expand, we see a decrease in fraction woody cover, but we're kind of digging into why there's this change. And that's the most pronounced change or departure of those two different proxies. Um, is right there at the end. So good eye and I, we don't know yet. That's fair enough. Um, sometimes these, you know, the different lines of evidence that we use don't always um, point to the same answer. And that's some, you know, I think for scientists, that's where the fun is sometimes. Um, so <laughs> you may have sort of answered this already, but I think it's, it's worthwhile to kind of ask again in the way that it's phrased. Walter asks, has it been determined what climate and geologic changes caused grasses to dominate over woody plants in Eastern Africa? It's a bit of an open question still. And in part, it's because reconstructing CO2 in the atmosphere 10 million years ago is, is so uh, difficult. And um, so in this paper we wrote in 2019, where we suggested uh, that it's probably a CO2 decrease that led to the spread of these grasses. Um, we, we got there essentially by eliminating all the other possible major mechanisms. We didn't see a change, a big change in, in rainfall amount. Um, and we don't think it was a change in seasonality. But you know, all, there are all these little levers, you know, and, and you can imagine that each ecosystem can be close to that transition stage. And it depends what lever you pull and how hard you need to pull it. But, to the best of our knowledge, based on the work we've done thus far and the work many others have done over the last 30 years, we think it's probably a CO2 drop, but um, there are many people who would probably argue against us and, and we don't have the direct atmospheric CO2 measurements to, uh, to be able to support that because nobody knows how to make those yet. So this next question from a different Adam um, is one that I think is in some ways the million dollar question. Um, he says the timetable correlates with major movements in the Rift Valley, opening, closing, resulting in lakes opening, drying, environments changing, purely due to geological movements. Hasn't this been the main driver of hominid evolution? Well, another, another wonderful question. Um, we, the, the role of, tectonics were the opening of the rift in this particular case and its effect on climate and evolution are really tough to tease apart and um, it's not something that I can do alone and so I'm part of a big group it's called the Turconomyosin project and we're looking over the last 25 million years or so at the interplay between tectonics climate and evolution so we assembled this wonderful team that includes tectonic modelers who are basically making a, these these videos that run for 25 million years and it shows the opening of the rift and where sediment is being eroded and deposited and then we also have climate modelers who can tell us what rainfall was like what the seasonality of the rainfall like when were the rainy months when were the dry months and those models are beginning to talk to each other uh, well, the modelers, but they make the models talk. And so the climate and tectonic models are coupled. And so, you know, what I do is generate evidence from uh, the geologic record from fossils that can help constrain those models. And then they run these simulations. And, and that's our approach right now is to get a big old group together with different specialists, particularly modelers, uh, and try to tease apart the role of climate and tectonics in the evolution of us. So it sounds like the answer is stay tuned. 
Yes, absolutely. <laughs> um, I have a deep time question from Rachel who asks, are there any dinosaur bones you have studied with these methods? And I might add a question onto to that about like sort of what's the time, time depth that your methods can be used to investigate? Mm. So um, I have never worked on dinosaurs, uh, but the methods we use, like I didn't talk about teeth today, but we can look at the diets of past dinosaurs using isotopes in their teeth. Um, and then for the biomarker stuff, yeah, if you send me a box of dirt that's 70 million years old, you know, and n times dinosaurs, we can we can try to reconstruct um, the past vegetation. It's it's more challenging because uh, grasses were just coming on the scene. I think the oldest grass evidence is around 100 million, 80 million years old. So we're moving into these ecosystems, these vegetation communities that look absolutely nothing like today. And so you really have to be uh, creative in thinking about these, what we call non-analog ecosystems, if you're gonna try to reconstruct them using these geochemical methods. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, that, you know, the really deep past look very different than today. Mm -hmm. um, here's a question, another sort of methods question from Niels. Could your analysis help paleontologists identify places to look for early hominids? Hmm. Not in the Marine Corps stuff, because that's that's capturing a vegetation signal from, you know, let's say tens of thousands of square kilometers in eastern Africa. And, and we'll do stuff in lake cores or actually outcrops where we get a much more local signal. But I think, you know, the, the best way and, and Perhaps the only way to look for hominid fossils is to put on your boots and go out and look for fossils. And th the first step to that is actually to get in the right time zone. You don't want to go look for hominid fossils in um, 30 million year old um, sediments. So, you know, you call your geologist friend, ask them how old this, you know, hill of dirt is. And if it's in the right time zone, say zero to five million years, put on your boots and start looking. Excellent. I think actually that's a that's a great place. We only have another minute or two left. So I'll ask probably one more question, but I sort of like wrapping up with the idea of putting our boots on and going and looking for more hominin fossils. Um, but here's here's a big scale question from Stephen. As the rift opens, will it eventually become an ocean? Mm, I love that question. It's such a future looking question, but also we look deep, deep in the Earth's past to understand that. And um, yeah, there's a lot of energy in the East African rift. It's basically unzipping itself from up near Djibouti. And it's the, the sort of incipient rift is down somewhere in Malawi now. So if you look at a map, you'll see it unzipping. Um, and the Red Sea is opening. And so um, I can't say for sure because I'm not a geophysicist, but it's looking like Eastern Africa might be on its own just as Madagascar is on its own in some amount of years, certainly in the order of millions or tens of millions, unless it runs out of gas and then it'll just stay, but yes. I will try not to end the program being too unsettled by the um, thought of <laughs> the rift unzipping. Um, so thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Um, and we will conclude today's virtual program. Please join me in thanking Kevin for sharing his work with us. I'd also like to give special thanks to those who made this program possible, to our behind the scenes team who helped sort through your questions, to our donors, volunteers, and viewers like you. And finally, to all our partners who help us reach, educate, and empower millions of people around the world today and every day. Thank you. I hope you'll join us for our next Hot Topic program next month on Thursday, May 19th at 1130 a.m. with Dr. Nina Jablonski from Penn State University on the evolution of skin tones, a reflection of human adaptation and health. After that, we're going to take a break with our hot, program, hot Topic programs for the summer, and we'll begin up again in the early fall. Check back on our website for more information soon. We've put a link in the Q&A where you can find information about our upcoming programs and how to sign up for the museum's weekly e-newsletter. That's the best way to stay informed on upcoming programs and learn more about the museum's research and exhibitions. 
After this webinar ends, you'll see a survey pop up asking for some feedback about the program. Please take a moment to respond. We're very curious to know what topics you might be interested in seeing for future programs, and we appreciate your input. Again, thanks to the participants. Thank you, Kevin, for rolling with some of the technological difficulties. Um, and thank you to the audience for being here. We'll see you next month.